Hi, and welcome to Dark Window. I'm your host, Jim Mann. Here on this program, I will be talking with many of the leading investigators, researchers, and authors on the topics of UFOs, UAPs, alien abductions, extraterrestrials, and a host of many other fascinating and related topics. So please join me and my guest for the next hour as we reach out. This is Dark Window and Broadcasting. And hello, everyone. I'm Jim Mann. Today I have here in the studio with me Dr. Robert Farrell. Now, this is the second time I've had uh, Dr. Farrell with me, and uh, and we're going to have another fascinating conversation today. Now, for those of you who are not familiar with uh, Dr. Farrell, he has a Bachelor of Science in Mechanical Engineering from Ohio State University. He has an MBA from Western New England College and his doctorate of engineering from the University of Massachusetts. He also spent 15 years as a professor uh, at Penn State. So Bob's with us tonight, and he's got some really fun stuff to talk about. I think you'll find this extremely interesting. Um, He's got a number of books, which he will introduce to us uh, as we go. But tonight, we're going to talk about the science behind Noah's Flood. And Bob, how are you doing tonight? I'm doing fine, Jim. Thank you for inviting me. Well, great. I'm glad to have you. And this is the second time. And uh, the last time I had you on, it was a fascinating talk about the Nazca mummies and what's going on down in Peru and Bolivia and in that area. But now we're going to talk about uh, the science behind the flood of Noah's day. So first off, to get started, what is it that... uh, made you write this book? Because what we're talking about is an entire book that you wrote. What made you write this book? Uh, well, what, what, I, what made me get even involved in the, the topic of Noah's Flood was Zachariah Sitchin. Um, I had been doing research. I, I read his 12th planet. And mm-hmm. um, at, at that point, I, I thought, geez, it's, it's all ties together, you know, the, the Sumerian experience and everything. And uh, so I started digging into it, studying the Sumerian culture, and uh, <clears throat> and that led to the the realization that the, the flood in the Bible, called Noah's flood, was actually a Sumerian uh, event. So um, and then I just I went from there, <laughs> and I actually in the book, I think I spent about the whole chapter. Um, <clears throat> talking about Zachariah Sitchin and his work, because the book, as you're going to see a picture of it in a minute, um, was published in 1976. But he was proposing things that um, that were out of the realm of most science at that time in 1976. And so when I wrote my book, I had 40 years of experience, you know, beyond when he wrote his book, to go back and point to everything that he stated that at the time, uh, <clears throat> where probably people would roll their eyes at, but today uh, they're facts more or less. So he was pretty much dead on what he was saying. And uh, anyway, uh, and the other thing, uh, as far as this particular topic, uh, when I started writing this book, I didn't realize how at the end, when I finished the book, how well it lined up with the Old Testament and as far as some of the events that occurred. <clears throat> The dates are another question, but the events uh, pretty much line up with what's in the Old Testament. So um, I will go to the next slide then. Yeah, yeah, let's let's roll through this. Okay. So the question was that about Noah's flood for a long time. Um, people didn't take it seriously. They thought it was maybe an allegory. You know, it certainly was a right. myth. But maybe it was an allegory to teach uh, good behavior or something. But that changed when uh, Sir Sir Leonard Woolley from England uh, in 1922 went to Ur and started digging. Mm -hmm. And what he dug up over the years, he put into his book in 1929 called The Ur of the Chaldees. Um, And some of the conclusions that he drew from his his search was that, first of all, indeed, the flood, the, the flood in the Bible was a Sumerian event, and it occurred in Mesopotamia, which is basically the valley between the Tigris and Euphrates rivers. And it was a local flood. Uh, A lot of people think that the 
Noah's flood was a world flood. And uh, there are a lot of flood stories around the world, at least 300 of them. Uh, but this particular flood was not a world flood. Um, ho however, to anybody who happened to be in a boat floating <laughs> in the middle of this flood, because right. it was so extensive, you wouldn't have been able to see any land. So you might have concluded that it was a world flood. Uh, his research showed him that the flood actually came from the south, which was interesting. Most floods in that region would come in the springtime, you know, when the snow melts in the mountains. And uh, so they'd have common flooding, but it came from the north. Well, this one he concluded came from the south, and it was at least well over uh, 6,000 years ago. Um, so this is the floodplain, basically where the flood occurred. <clears throat> And you can see two rivers, the Tigris and the Euphrates. Uh, where they two come closest together is actually Baghdad today. And here's a map that shows where the Sumer was, or where the Sumerians were. Um, and they were superseded by the Akkadian and, and then Babylonian empires. Um, and again, I, I, I usually on these maps, I throw in Baghdad just for reference so you know where what we're looking at here. Mm -hmm. But down toward the bottom of the screen, you'll see Ur, which is where Wooly did his dig, and Iridu, which is claimed to be the oldest city by the Sumerians. So the question is, when did it occur? And it depends on how you calculate it. If you look at Genesis and assume that uh, time starts with Adam, uh, and you pick out the dates and everything out of the, the Old Testament, you would they would add up to about 4,300 years ago. Woolley, though, with his research, claimed that it was more than 6,000 years ago. And Sitchin, in his work, felt that it was 13,000 years ago and was the result of uh, us coming out of the Ice Age. And there was a huge amount of ice along the eastern edge of Antarctica. And it was, it was cascading into the Indian Ocean. And that was forming, uh, creating uh, mega tsunamis. And I, I agree with that. I just take a little exception to his dating because, as I said, I have 40 years better data than he had. And so you'll see that I placed the estimate of around 14,200 years ago. And this is a famous uh, Sumerian seal uh, designating the Great Flood. The flood, the Great Flood, is a kind of a dividing point in the Sumerian culture. This thinks they talk about what happened before the flood and what happened after the flood. So the flood was a dividing point. <clears throat> so this is Baghdad today, again, just for reference. And uh, when the humans returned after the flood, this is the area they returned to, down back to Ur and Uruk and Iridu at the very bottom there. That's actually in, in the uh, northwest corner of what today is the Persian Gulf. Um, and then Kish, which... The reason Kish is on that map is because Kish was the first uh, town that was allowed to be ruled by humans, which which implies that before that maybe aliens uh, ruled, ruled the towns. Hmm. And this is Zachariah Sitchin. Um, he passed in 2010. And this is the book that got my attention. It was published. Actually, <laughs> I got to fix that. That six keeps dropping down. It was published in 1976. Uh, and it was the first book in his Earth Chronicle series. And this was the one that kind of turned me on to uh, his historical events related to uh, relating to the subject of ufology. So one of the things that Sitchin, who had, by the way, uh, he, he actually had a degree in journalism. And I think because of that, he was able to travel around. But over the years, he taught himself many languages and, and even how to translate uh, cuneiform. Um, so that he could collect data on his own. But his main interest, he was really interested in finding and learning about the roots of his religion. And uh, so he studied a lot of mythology and he put it all together, he tied it all together. So this is his conclusion based on his research. And he says that every 3,600 years ago, this is what the Sumerians believe. I don't know if they mentioned 3,600, they call it a shark. Um, sure, yes. Yeah, Nibiru would appear in the southern sky. And you see, I have that in red because I want you to remember that. We're going to talk about that more later. And uh, I did some calculations as far as uh, given the, the 
definition of the orbit, which was uh, a period of 3,600 years. And uh, assuming that the closest approach to the sun was at the asteroid belt where this collision occurred, um, I did a calculation using uh, some simple equations for uh, uh, astronomers might be using them. But anyway, and concluded, number one, I'll mention this again, that uh, at the bottom I see it here, uh, that at the farthest uh, distance that Nibiru would be, would be 12 times as far out as Pluto. So it, when it goes out there, it goes way out there in the cold and dark. But it would probably only be able to be seen when it comes back in toward the sun and it passes into in, inside the orbit of uh, Neptune. And, and I, I picked that because you can look at the sky and you can see Saturn and you can see Jupiter, you can see Mars, but you can't see Neptune. I think you almost have to have a telescope to see Neptune. So therefore, I'm assuming that anything that's that far out can't be seen. Mm -hmm. And so I did a rough calculation and figured that uh, Nibiru would only be visible on each of its passes around the sun for 25, maybe 30 years. And that's what uh, the, the Sumerians would be you know, studying and maybe why they built some of their structures that we're going to see later. Um, and also, Sitchin concluded from his search that uh, the Sumerians believe that, that, that the, our, <coughs> our Earth actually was a result of a collision between Nibiru and Tiamat, which was a very large planet, about twice the size of the Earth. And it was in an orbit around the asteroid belt. And that collision with one of the moons of Nibiru with, and Timat ended up creating Earth and it, our large moon as they are today, but they were thrown down into a lower orbit. And in my book, I give a lot of evidence that that's probably correct. There's some scientific evidence that will support that. Anyway, um, like I said, I did calculate how far out N Nibiru would be. And you, if you lived on um, Nibiru, you'd have to have some good winter clothes for about... 3,000 years. <laughs> oh, I'd imagine. Yeah. So the other thing that Sitchin said was the Sumerians believed that their lords, what they called the Anunnaki, came to Earth about 450,000 years ago. And uh, they came here and, and were actually mining gold. And apparently they needed the gold uh, for their planet to, to protect their planet. And I'm still trying to figure out what that is all about. But anyway, they came here to collect gold, and after a couple hundred thousand years, they got tired of digging. And so that's when uh, one of their science officers, I call him Spock, that's Enki, uh, figured out a way to uh, genetically alter Homo erectus and uh, create Homo sapiens sapien, who's got enough intelligence and can talk. And that, that became their worker bees. And... Um, when they created them, you know, if you, as an engineer, when you build something, you build it to last uh, and you don't want to have to keep building it. So they did. They created the humans to reproduce, but th they didn't have the fate of uh, dying of old age. And so, therefore, you can imagine how the population uh, would have expanded. Um, so it, I, it, I point out to the fact also that Sitchin was telling all, all this stuff in his book published in 1976. But 10 years later in the Journal of Science, uh, some scientists from UC Berkeley uh, studying the mitochondrial DNA from 147 women uh, determined that the first human actually appeared in South Africa about 200,000 years ago. And uh, I, this diagram at the bottom shows where what mitochondria is. It's the energy producing part of our cells it has its own DNA, but 100% of that DNA is from the female, no male. And that's why they called the first human Eve, because they were studying the mitochondrial DNA. Well, some people took exception to the 200,000 years ago and thought, well, maybe it was 5,000 years ago. But wouldn't you know, uh, in 2003, in the Journal of Nature, there was an article where they had found a fossilized Homo sapien skull in, in Ethiopia, that they dated to be 160,000 years old. So that kind of supported that whole 200,000 year uh, time frame. Also, there was a metropolis, ancient metropolis discovered in South Africa um, that 
was dated to be about 200,000 years old. And it, the area that it covered was about the size of Manhattan Island. And in that same area, there were thousands of ancient gold mines. So that, again, supported what Sitchin had determined. So, again, I had done a lot of research on the Sumerian culture, and I think I mentioned some of it in our last talk. But they were polytheistic. They had 12 de deities. And that's a number that should remember because we're going to see 12 appear several times here. Um, and it was a sacred number. There's a lot of th things that they invented that were related to the number 12, like geometry, for instance. But they had two main gods. That was Anu and Enlil. Uh, Anu was the sky god, or, and he was the head god. He was king of all the gods. And Enlil was the god of wind, air, earth, and storms. Uh, and those are the two main characters in their list of deities. And you'll see that at the end of this talk. You'll see evidence of that. Um, but the Sumerians, when they returned after the flood, were quite inventive. And they invented things like medicine and, of course, the wheel. Uh, but they didn't invent writing until about 6,000 years ago. But they are credited with inventing the first writing. But the problem is, um, before... If you go back before 6,000 years, there's nothing written down to give you a record of what happened. And uh, so what had to, we have to rely on mythology, basically. And there's a lot of scientists uh, who are trying to understand what happened in, in prehistoric times, in other words, before 6,000 years ago. Uh, and they're starting to uh, take seriously information that's in these oral traditions, the mythology. Now, two, two important ones, I think, uh, that people may have encountered, and one is Atrahasis, and the other is the Epic of Gilgamesh. <clears throat> and I remember when I was in high school, I, we had to read the Epic of Gilgamesh. It was an interesting story. So in Tablet 11 of Gilgamesh, who was the king of Uruk, um, he went on a quest to, for eternal life because he had learned that uh, up Napishtim, who had been the king of Sherpak, and that Sherpak on a map is just below Baghdad, just to put things in perspective. <clears throat> but he heard that uh, Up Napishtim had been given eternal life, and uh, that sounded interesting to him. He thought maybe he'd like to have that, so he went on an expedition to find him, and he did. He found Up Napishtim, and here, this is in red, at the headwaters of the Euphrates up in Turkey. So we'll, that's important to the story today. Mm -hmm. Anyway, so when he finds up the Pishtim, he tells uh, Gilgamesh the, the story of what happened. And he said uh, that the, the storm was terrifying to see. Um, and finally, the boat came to rest on Mount uh, Nimish, which no one seems to know where that is. And they think maybe it's Mount Judy. <clears throat> but regardless, uh, the fact that he rest, came to rest on a mountain, which had been north, proves that indeed uh, the flood came from the south. It was not a normal seasonal flood. It was a major flood that came from the south. This is just an example of some of the artisanship uh, of the Sumerians. Of course, this was done after they returned after the flood. Uh, but you can see that they had capabilities to do beautiful artwork um, and fine cloth. And in fact, they they were well known to and selling, I think, as a a product, the, the, the fine the linens and things that they could produce. So what we see here is a, a, a map that I kludged out of a, a standard map to make the, the, the Persian Gulf look much smaller. It looks like a lake. And that's for a reason, because if I go back 15,000 years, uh, the sea level was 370 feet lower than it is today. And the deepest part of the Persian Gulf is only 150 feet. So therefore, it was a lake back 15,000 years ago. And it, it went down probably through some kind of a, a narrow gorge into the Indian Ocean. And it's fed by four rivers, just like the Bible says. The Euphrates, the Tigris, the Pisan, and the Gion. Um, so that fits with the Bible. So the question might be how, how I came up with a different date, let's say, than uh, uh, Zachariah Sitchin. And again, it was because I have more current scientific data. But there's something that is called the melt pulse 
melt water pulse 1A. Uh, and that occurred about 14,500 years ago. And later on, I'll show you a, a, a diagram that shows that. <clears throat> um, so that was one thing I took into account. Uh, the other thing is I felt that after the flood, they ended up producing some, some of the oldest monolithic structures on Earth. One of them is called Gobekli Tepe. And uh, so the, the exposed sections of that have been dated to be 12,000 years old. And uh, but they believe that using ground penetrating radar, that there are many more underneath down further below, below that may be uh, as much as 14,000 years old. And uh, so that's why I came up with the 14,200 years for the event. <clears throat> now, there's a professor uh, from Victoria University in New Zealand who was uh, discussing the, what he called the theory of ice ages. And that it would say that uh, that the recent interglacial would end with and be, uh, or at least be interrupted by an Antarctic ice sheet surge. By that he means that the the, the ice sheets that uh, you you find around the perimeter of a continent <clears throat> or island, <clears throat> excuse me, um, will will just just break up and disappear. And uh, he said in the past they would have caused distinct rises in sea level up to maybe 100 feet and in a very short period of time, perhaps less than 100 years. And uh, so he also said that the, the chevrons that have been discovered in the floor of, um, I mean, not in the floor, but in the, um, on, on land in Madagascar, the southern part of Madagascar, may have be, uh, provide good evidence for a mega tsunami occurring so here is a, a map that shows sea level going back to 24,000 years ago. And you can see it if you look at to the lower left corner, we're coming out of the ice age. Um, but around 14,500 to 13,500, there was a period of time there called the bowling Alarod Interstadial. And it was a warming period. And you can see that it resulted in a very steep rise in sea level, uh, about 100 feet almost. It's kind of hard to tell from this graph, but it was a very dramatic change. And, uh, and so that's one of the other reasons I picked 14,200 years. <clears throat> Excuse me. Hey, Bob, uh, just real quickly. Yeah. Um, going back to that chart, your previous slide. Okay. Now, I noticed over here on the uh, right hand, it says Santa Catalina, Rio de Janeiro, uh, Jamaica, Tahiti. Um, so as the, as the water that was captured in ice during the Ice Age, as yeah. these waters melted throughout the years, um, it created these, these islands or what's... What is the purpose of these, uh, of these, well, some of them like Santa Catalina, that's a island, uh, Rio de Janeiro, that's a city. Uh, do you know what the significance of all this over here on the right is? Uh, well, what I can say is uh, going back to what people sometimes think that the Noah's flood was a world flood. If you think right. of, how the planet was with sea level 370 feet lower, uh, there were continental shelves that were exposed and there probably would have been people, uh, cities, whatever, uh, that, had, that had developed along the edge for, because they catch fish there or whatever. And w when the sea level rises a hundred feet in a short period of time, that would be a pretty dramatic thing. If you ask somebody who lives in Miami, would you be bothered if the sea level rose a hundred feet over the next hundred years? Uh, well, they'd probably be out yeah. some on their property right now. <laughs> yeah. Well, as we know, as we know yeah. that uh, science, and um, <clears throat> in the last hundred years, we have discovered several cities that are completely submerged under the yes. water. They they were outside. I mean, they were above the water level at one time. Exactly. Which obviously, which is why there's a there's a there's a city there in. You know, so, okay, so, that, 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 I was just wondering, I mean. Yeah, that was, uh, what you're talking about is what they discovered off the western coast of India. 
uh, and it's under about 200 feet of water. And if you look at this graph here, you can almost see what time in history uh, that, that, that that city that was originally built at the edge of the water mm -hmm. would have been buried and ended up 200 feet under the water. Exactly. Uh, and it was about 9,000 years ago. That's what they dated. Gotcha. Okay. So well, the, thank you for going back to that slide. I Yeah, no problem. I just had some quick questions there. Yeah. There's a lot of questions. There's... Uh, we don't have enough time. <laughs> I know. Actually, this almost has to be a two part, but then we'll do it. In one I part. know, right? It does. Yes. <laughs> so I need, I need to talk a little bit about tsunamis and what they are because people have this vision of a huge wave or something. And um, so this is a diagram that kind of shows what, what a tsunami is. It, it's, it's created by energy that put into the water, either by maybe an asteroid impact or a huge chunk of land falling into the water, or even ice, which is what I'm going to say happened, uh, and even sh shifting tectonic plates. You know, I remember down uh, near Thailand a few years back, there was a tectonic plate that shifted and caused a mega tsunami down there. I'm uh, not a mega yeah. tsunami, but a regular tsunami. tsunami. So we're talking about regular tsunamis here. A mega tsunami simply is a larger scale, um, and exactly. but that's what I think we're, we're dealing with for as far as Noah's flood. So what happens is energy radiates out from the impact, and when it when they, when it reaches at a very high speed, when it reaches the lower you know shallower water water, it almost seems like it climbs right out. Um, but it really manifests itself almost like a surge. In fact, my next slide. Um, this was the tsunami in Japan. I was about and, to. Uh, you notice that it's not a wave. It, it's clear that the water that had been on the other side of that wall w had been normally lower, but the water level just rose up and it keeps coming and keeps coming. And that mm -hmm. water flows inland and it takes buildings and people and moves them inland. But eventually it'll return. You know, it goes back again and drags all that broken stuff and people and dead bodies back out into the ocean. So that's what happens with the tsunami. A mega tsunami would be very similar, except the magnitude might be an order of magnitude greater. So um, the other thing I want to talk about is some glacier dynamics, because that's important to understand. And we should think about this, by the way, in regards to our own future. Um, so there's, if you look at the Antarctic from a satellite, uh, on the western edge is there was a, a Larsen ice sheet, ice shelf, I'm sorry, they call it ice shelf. And I don't know if this is going to work. Let's see. No, it doesn't. I'm sorry, I got to go back. I guess I have to remember if I'm going to do this, I have to have separate slides. Buried under this picture is some other pictures <laughs> mm -hmm. um, that shows that ice shelf there within, within a, in 2002, as it says at the top there, it actually collapsed and floated out to sea. And it, and it was the size of Rhode Island, that whole ice sheet. Um, uh, so you might say, well, so what? That was an ice was floating on the water. And you're right, it wouldn't really affect the sea level. Um, but the important thing that we have to keep in mind because there's other ice sheets that, are, that may be disappearing and creating the same problem. And here's the problem. That ice shelf, or ice sheet um, usually is grounded and it holds back glaciers that are sitting on land. And so the only thing, if an ice shelf leaves, the only thing holding back the glacier is just the friction that might occur with the soil underneath. And to, to make things worse, during a, a warming spell where the surface of the glacier melts and forms, forms uh, moulons or pools of water, they would find a crack and, and seep down and, and put water underneath to add a lubricant. So once that ice shelf disappears, these large glaciers can rapidly advance toward the coast. And by the way, we have some in Antarctica that people are worried about. Uh, the Thwart uh, Glacier, if it ends up in the water, it will raise sea level by up to 15 feet. And again, people in uh, Miami might want to worry about that. Yeah. Right. So if we go back 20,000 years ago, as we came out of the, well, and actually it was the middle of the ice age, uh, 
the, the ice along the eastern edge, which is on the right side of this graph, uh, in Antarctica was 45,000 feet thick. That's eight miles. Tremendous amount of ice. All lined up along the eastern edge of uh, Antarctica. That's really hard to wrap your head around that. It is. I mean, you know, higher than Mount Everest. And so Unbelievable. Here's a topographic map, and those lines indicate uh, elevations, basically. But mm -hmm. you'll notice those blue lines get pinched together the closer you get to the water. That's because it's a steeper slope. And so uh, the glacier or the ice that's on or snow or whatever it is, it's sitting on land, can can accelerate once it approaches the ocean. The other thing to notice is uh, that that, that that black line, that dashed line, is kind of where I, I indicated that this is where this huge mass is sitting. And notice that it's some distance away from the axis of the Earth. So when the Earth is spinning, there's probably a certain amount of centrifugal force trying to urge that ice into the ocean. So you got all these things happening here. Now, eight miles, this this would, imagine the scale here is eight miles. So uh, eight by eight by eight is 500 cubic miles of ice. And the center of gravity of that is four miles above the water. So when that falls into the water, you can imagine that's a huge amount of energy that goes into the water and probably enough to even shake the crust of the earth and certainly uh, start causing other uh, chunks to break loose along the, the edge of the uh, Antarctica there. Uh, and maybe even if it shakes the crust of the earth, might even start some uh, tremors around the world. Mm -hmm. So you'd be forewarned that maybe there's a tremor, you know, an earthquake and starts rumbling. In fact, I think that was described in some of the myths that the, there was this rumbling that occurred. So anyway, uh, I, again, I, I picked 14,200 years, primarily from that graph. And I say that the thousands of cubic miles of ice were released during the collapse and, uh, and the, the vibration would have caused a chain reaction. And, and also over a short period of time, as these keep falling in, eventually the sea level will rise uh, as much as 100 feet, according to that one graph that I showed you. Um, but it's going to cause earthquakes. Um, and it did not just happen one time. You'll see another graph I have here that it happened uh, in periodically, periodically, in like over thousands of years, it would happen again. Um, and we keep doing that until things stabilize. But I showed on that other graph that all that mass is lined up on the 60 degree longitude, which just happens to be pointing right to the inlet of the Persian Gulf, wouldn't you know? And uh, so that that tsunami would have traveled right up through that Persian into the uh, lake at that time and continued on. And that so, would have been a that would have been a huge tidal wave. Yeah, I'm estimating 500 to a 1500 foot high surge. Now, wow. there is some there is some historical evidence for things of that scale. Uh, I don't have I don't have a graph here for this because I was taking as much as I could out to get inside this time frame. Uh, but in uh, Yatuta Bay in uh, Alaska uh, in 1958, and I don't remember that, but I remember 1958, uh, uh -huh. there was what you would call a mega tsunami there. Uh, that was a bay that fishermen used to put into, and there's an island in the middle of it, so they would go in and anchor near that island. Well, that bay is fed by two glaciers that come in from each side, but there was a huge chunk of land that fell off of the bluff. I can't remember how many cubic uh, miles it was, but it was a lot that fell into the water. And the wave that it created wiped out trees as high as 1,700 feet above sea level in some places and another 600 feet. And so so that, that can happen. Right. And so I'm visualizing that this mega tsunami that caused the Noah's flood was in, uh, probably at least 1,000 feet, if not more than 1,500 more and, and maybe up to 1500 feet and it was a surge not just a huge wave um so anyway and here's noah sitting there uh he's got his ark he was forewarned and um he gets carried northwest from surapak which as i said is south of baghdad up into the foothills near and between uh, syria and turkey 
And I threw this in that maybe he had a chance to actually see Mount Judy, but I, I, I only when he gets lit later on, he might be able to see it, but not while he's on the water. Uh, so here is a, uh, a flood map basically of that region. And um, so you can look at the colors. So the, the bluer it is, uh, the deeper it is. And the, those line of arrows is his path following the Euphrates River because that would, I'm assuming that that would be a point where most of the water would flow first because it, it's a lower, lower terrain. And, um, and actually there's kind of a land bridge off here that I have circled in red, that dike that kept the water from splashing over into the other area. But right where I draw that circle is about where I think um, Noah came aground, okay? Because that's close to the headwaters of the uh, Euphrates. And I'm basing that on a myth that says that's where you're going to find up the Pishtim, who is Noah. And I throw in San Leorfa there, which is Urfa, because I'm going to talk about that later. Uh, that's supposedly the birthplace of Abraham. So here is a, a, a diagram that shows uh, the Western Pacific post-glacial sea level history going back to 22,000 years. And you can see how periodically something happens and there's a, a sharp rise in sea level. And so the one that's marked with that red vertical dash line is where I say that's the one that, that got Noah. Um, even though the, the sea level was 350 feet below uh, where he was living, uh, with a tsunami that has a surge of 1,500 feet, that's not a problem. It would have picked him up and continued with the surge to carry him northwest. But you can see that um, the, a, the A period, it was about um, 3,662 years. But then the next uh, event occurred uh, in a shorter period, about 20 600 years, and then the one after that, about 2,200 years, and then finally the last one, about 1,700 years ago. So it's not a consistent period of 3,600 years because, and I point that out because uh, Sitchin and some people were of the opinion that what caused that ice to cascade off the, the coast of uh, Antarctica uh, was the gravitational influence of Nibiru as it came around and, and, um, uh, that gravity would have caused that some instability on the ice sitting there and it would have fallen into the ocean. I did some calculations as far as the gravitational influence, even assuming the Bureau was as big as uh, Jupiter. And as it passed around on the asteroid belt, that distance from the earth, I calculated the gravitational influence it would have. <laughs> and then I looked at the moon and a lot of people don't realize that the moon sometimes is closer and sometimes is farther away. <laughs> Right, and I looked at the gravitational influence of the moon from far to close, and it's far greater than the effect that the uh, Nibiru would have. So, if that gravitational change is going to be something that causes this to happen, it would have been by the moon and not by Nibiru. The other thing is, you notice that the period uh, for each one gets shorter and shorter, and you would expect that if you re realize that what's really happening is ice is melting. So the ice thickness is getting shallower and shallower along the rim of the Antarctica as we're coming out of the ice age. And, uh, and so it's not only the severity of the, uh, um, of the super tsunami, uh, it also would occur maybe more frequently. But so the bottom line is, uh, I don't, I think this clearly shows that it's not Nibiru that's causing the, um, the, the ice to fall, to fall in. It's 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 just the the warming thing that's happening. A sort of a cyclic, um, uh, a cycle that the Earth goes through every th several thousand years anyway. Yeah. Well, think about it. imagine that huge chunk of ice that I showed you that 500 cubic miles. Right. Well, after that falls in the water, it's going to take a little while for the the, the ice behind it to to march to march to the edge. You know, Correct. Maybe a couple thousand years. I don't know. Uh, and so, so th that could account maybe for this changing period. But also notice that uh, uh, after D, we come to an area where it's safe. 
about seven to 8,000 years ago. So at that time, somehow the Sumerians who escaped might have known that it was safe to return home. And so that's another thing to keep in mind, because a little later I'm going to bring that back up again, as to when they came back and maybe why. So anyway, if I were involved in a thing like that, first thing I'd do after I hit dry land is I'd jump out and go to higher land. And uh, so I think they did. And and I think they stayed at the high land up in, in the Turkey around Turkey, which was uh, where, where, um, where I think they were, it was about 1,500 feet above sea level, that in general. Uh, San Lirfa, for instance, is 1,500 feet above sea level. So that's high ground. They probably wouldn't have to worry about uh, another tsunami bothering them there. And, and so they would, for some reason, not know to return right away. Uh, I don't know how they learned that, hey, it's time to go back. Maybe, some, maybe they sent scouts down, and if they didn't come home, they figure they drowned. But anyway, somehow they knew that it was time to go home about 8,000 years ago. Well, while they're there up in Turkey, uh, his Noah's descendants were, were polytheistic. You know, they worshiped 12 gods. And so they would have built temples. And there's evidence that I'm going to show you in a minute of uh, several of them. Uh, one is Navali Kori, and uh, the other is Gobekli Tepe that people are familiar with. And they also, there's a few others, but I'm not going to get into them. And also, uh, toward that, the end of the, the near 12,000 years ago, they even uh, invented uh, agriculture. You'll see that too. So here's an aerial shot looking down uh, at the Navali Quarry, where I think is Noah's house at the headwaters of the Euphrates. Now, you see that they, they built a dam over the Euphrates River. Uh, in 1990. So from about 1988 or 89, um, before the water started building up in the, behind the dam, um, the, a lot of archaeologists, or at least a, a German team of archaeologists, went to, to document in the Valley Cory, and you'll see pictures of that. And this, by the way, th this location is only about 25 miles from Urfa, where, where I believe Abraham was born. So here's a drawing of what the ruins at uh, Navali Quarry look like. And it has 12 columns around it, which tells me it's probably Sumerian. And in the center are two main columns that are anthropomorphic. I'll show you some close-ups so you can see hands carved into them. Here, you can see the hands. And also, they were facing south. The two columns were facing south. Remember that. So here we are. Um, there's the Lali Quarry where Nora lived. Noah lived, you know, like 25 miles from Urfa, which I think. Now, the reason I, I think Urfa is where Abraham was born is because I happened to stumble a, a con, onto a. Um, travel log. I, I was surfing the internet and this guy was escorting people around town in, in, in San Lirfa or Urfa. And he said, follow me. I'm going to take you to the cave where Abraham was born. So that got me to think uh, maybe that's where Abraham was born because it made a lot more sense than thinking that he was born in Ur, which is way down. <laughs> uh, it just doesn't make sense. Uh, mm -hmm. So this makes a lot of sense, at least to me. But you can see um, there's Gobekli Tepe that's only about nine miles from uh, Urfa. It's about a thousand feet higher elevation and it overlooks the plain. And from that elevation, you could probably see Mount Judy, which is about 125 miles away. So this is from National Geographics. Um, and it, it clearly shows that this is a religious structure, at least from a Sumerian point of view, if you think about that. And I believe those two tall columns that are there, just like they were uh, over at uh, the Valley Quarry, those two represent the, the, the chief deities of the Sumerians, Anu and Enlil. And again, guess what? They're looking south. Interesting. 
And here's a closer look. You can see the hands. They deliberately don't, didn't put faces on those for some reason. But they otherwise made them look uh, anthropomorphic. And by the way, at that period of time, all these people were Stone Age people, hunter-gatherers. Okay? According to our records, they, they were, certainly. Yeah. So the archaeologist, uh, the late uh, Klaus Schmidt, who did a dig at uh, Gobekli Tempe, uh, he started it in 1994. And as I said, the, he, this is like 2,500 feet above sea level, which is 1,000 feet higher than Urfa, and uh, about nine miles from Urfa. But by 2008, after 14 years, he only un uncovered four rings, like that picture I showed you. Right. Four of those things. Um, but he had apparently employed ground penetrating radar because he was convinced that below, further down, there were at least 16 more of those circles and older, he, he estimated 14,000 years old. So these, the, the, on the surface, he, the four that he uncovered, um, he, he dated to be about 12,000 years before present. But he said that the, and these are his observations, that the surrounding area, there were the villages, the people that lived there were hunter gatherers, and they were, but they were Stone Age people. But and what they they had, they did have facilities for storing wild grain. Um, and by the way, he thought that probably the hunting would have been good in that region at that time. That the climate was nice, so so they they you know they had a pretty good life. In fact, it looked like they could even make beer out of that grain. And they did a chemical analysis of a. A vessel that they found. Uh, I don't know if it was carved out of rock or what, but uh, the chemical analysis showed that they had been making beer there, so they knew how to enjoy life, I guess. Um, and also, Klaus thought that uh, people came to these these structures as part of a religious event, but mysteriously, they were abandoned eight thousand years ago at Gobekli Tepe and filled in. And so people, why would they do that? Well, my answer is because somehow they knew it was safe to return home, back down to Ur and, and the, those cities that occurred, that they apparently knew about from previous stories. I don't know. <clears throat> anyway, so that, the timing was right. They knew, somehow they knew it was safe. There wasn't going to be any more mega tsunamis. And whatever they did wouldn't be wiped out. Now, here's an aerial picture of those four um, circles. And you notice which, which direction is south. And if you study those circles and you look for the two center uh, columns, you can see that they're all more or less pointing south. But it does vary. And that was I found that interesting. Um, but this is what they would see looking south. They would have a view of the southern horizon where they would be waiting for Nibiru to make its appearance. Hmm. And here is a graph, a, a drawing, or I superimposed over the photograph. And those are the four rings, with A being the oldest and D the, the youngest. But you notice the direction of the arrow. So A is pointing southeast. B is a little bit more south, and C is a little bit more south yet, and D is even more south. And so I'm thinking, well, let's suppose, I don't know how long it took them to build these, but maybe they, over a period of 30 years, they built them. And each time Nibiru would come up after uh, the transit, not, not for the every 3,600 years, but uh, the Earth's travel around the sun and everything, things change. Mm -hmm. So... Uh, it would be really unusual if Nibiru came up at the exact same spot every year. And uh, so I think this shows the, the, the fact that Nibiru was uh, trans, transferring across the horizon uh, as uh, celestial mechanics would dictate, I guess. Hmm. 
So I, I, I discovered this almost by accident, that, but I learned that in, in the Orthodox Jewish tradition, uh, it states that Abraham was born in Urfa, which I told you now, and not Ur, and spent time in the house of Noah and also the house of Shem, which is Noah's son. Um, and he received instructions there, because remember back then nothing was written down. It was all by oral tradition and, and they wrote memory. And some of these religious ceremonies may have been that the priest would stand up and recite the history of the flood to carry everything forward. Right. So nothing was actually written down until Moses, which was about 3,500 years ago. So there's a big gap of time there where I don't know uh, what happened in between. There. There's a big, big gap, and I haven't figured out how to deal with that. That's a very interesting concept, too, by the way. So um, here... Assuming that the flood was at 14,200 years ago, I took information uh, uh, from the Bible or someplace, I can't remember, based on w when Noah was born and died, okay? But I adjusted for 14,200. And so here you can see that uh, Noah lived 950 years and uh, Shem 600, and, and they died around a little over 13,700, 800 years. But if you look down below, I don't know if you can see that, Abraham, that his life overlapped their life. So it, so surely he could have gone to visit. Now it's only 25 miles away, right? From Yeah, he surely from Earth could, have, to, could have known those those people. Would have known them, could have visited them. And, and, yeah. and uh, that's what the uh, Jewish tradition says happened. Yeah. Well, Bob, we're just about out of time here. The hour has just slipped past us real quick. Okay. Well, um, um, let me, can I go forward for the big? Yeah. Okay. You, let me, let me skip over this because got a couple of minutes. Okay. This is, this is when uh, Noah's father, I mean, uh, Abraham's father was uh, taking the family and they ended up Heron died in the middle of that plane. Anyway, right. so the question, here's the route that uh, was taken by uh, Abraham. And the interesting thing is this colored map here that where the intersection of these na these nations is right there by Gobekli Tepe. Also, uh, it turns out that when they track the, the creation of uh, agriculture, that it, it agreed that that's about the area where it started and it almost followed the migration of the descendants of Noah. And the big question now, what does the ark look like? And unfortunately, there was a tablet that has instructions on it. And uh, this is the instructions. And there was uh, somebody actually built, and this is what, what it looks like. It's a round boat called a kufar. It wasn't, mm -hmm. wasn't the boat you're thinking of. And here's one, of a scale model. It's, it's a scale, full scale of, of the boat that Noah had built. And when you think about it, it doesn't need a bow on it. Because it's just designed to save you from a flood, and and it's, you're going to go wherever the flood takes you anyway. So why put a bow on it? So it's circular. And uh, however, if you go down to Hong Kong, you would see what you think it should look like. Uh, 450 feet long. I don't think Noah could have built that. I frankly don't. Yeah. I think the round one is more realistic. And uh, so that's it. Um. So those that are interested in furthering uh, their understanding of, of your viewpoints, they would uh, want to look at the science behind Noah's flood by Robert, by Dr. Robert Farrell. And it is certainly interesting. Uh, I would imagine that it would be met with some debate on many fronts and rightly so, but um after all, we're after the truth, and uh, you certainly have presented a lot of good scientific information to us today. Thank you. And I would like to have you back for a, a, a third discussion, maybe even regarding more into the science behind Noah's flood. Dr. Farrell, would you be open to that? Uh, sure. But, yeah, um, we've had but, to rush through this thing. That's a lot of yeah. information in a short time. Yeah. Um, uh, well, you know, one of the things that we could talk about is the uh, Zachariah Sitchin and the things that I've 
exactly show, yeah discovered that proved that he was right in what he said yeah and get and some of the uh, other reference material uh that we could discuss yeah but dr farrell we are completely out of time and it has been great listening to this i i haven't commented much because you just had so much information and i really appreciate you coming and you're welcome thank you for having me we will absolutely have you back for a, a third time meanwhile everyone thank you for joining us i hope you enjoyed this this uh, this bit of information i found it fascinating but thank you for joining us here in dark window and on behalf of dr robert farrell myself and my program manager patricia wilkinson we hope you have a good evening and thank you again Thank you.